Praise the Lord, God's children, because this is a day that the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. Welcome to the Master's Word. I have my volume way down. Sorry. <laughs> um, welcome to the Master's Word. You know, all Master's Word programs are Christian Internet radio and TV talk shows directed at educating, edifying, and helping the body of Christ gain understanding of God's Word and know who they are in Christ Jesus. I'm Dr. Stephanie. I'm your host. Let's pray, shall we? Father, we come into your presence with praise and thanksgiving in our hearts, simply just overflowing through our lips, Lord. We praise you, love you, and adore you. We thank you, Lord, that as we seek you, you and your kingdom, you always illuminate your word so that we gain the proper understanding of it. We thank you for the rhema word of God, for revelation knowledge and manifestation of your word alive and active in our hearts and lives. Bless those that have ears to hear, Lord, as we endeavor to love you more deeply and know you more intimately. Father, uh, we just thank the Holy Spirit right now for being with us, and we invite him to come in and take over his broadcast right now. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, <clears throat> did you come expecting to receive, my friends? Well, if not, you won't receive anything from God. So get those expectation levels elevated and get ready to receive. Today we're going to be talking about the immortality of the body, but let's worship a minute before we get started, shall we? Soak in worship if you don't know this song, or if you do, sing along with it. It's an awesome, awesome worship song. Behold the Lamb, I will worship. Seated high upon the throne. Behold the Lamb I will honor, magnify the Holy One, my joy and laughter. Thank you. 
to you about the immortality of the body and my friends this lesson is full of truth and revelation so I want you to pay extremely close attention our text is Hebrews chapter 6 verse 5 and have tasted the goodness of the Word of God and the powers of the age to come these powers of the age to come are in reference to the heavenly realm here on this earth we do partake of some powers of the heavenly realm and the power of knowledge, the power of life and all these realms are also there permanently in heaven. But thank God while here on this earth we have the divine privilege of partaking of that heavenly realm. You know we know that our physical body is functioning at a level that is not it wasn't really designed to function at. Well what do I mean? Well in the Garden of Eden it was designed never to die. And this physical body was not designed to just exist on mere physical food and oxygen. It was supposed to maintain life on God's life. We are not able to see the fullness of the immortality that God has for this physical body until Jesus comes. However, we do have a foretaste of what God has for the physical body here on this earth right now. And from time to time, God does allow for us to experience some of that immortality in our physical body. Now, we spoke... Um, previously about immortality in the realm of immortality on a ser in a series that I did um, and um, I spoke to you then about the foretaste that we have of, of uh, the upcoming wonderfulness of the of the immortality immortality of this this body I don't know if any of you turned tuned into it or not but if you didn't you can go on the archives of uh, Spreaker.com and Ustream.tv and get a hold of it now some people like Enoch walk straight into, into immortality without seeing death while others only partake of a glimpse of what the body is like. Um, let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 45. This whole chapter, chapter 15, is on the resurrection of the physical body. Verse 45. Thus it is written, the first man Adam became a living being, the last Adam became a living, uh, a life-giving spirit. I'm sorry. Alright, I'll say it again. Thus it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The, the last Adam became a living... I don't know why I keep saying that. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. Okay. So, from this we see that Jesus didn't just restore us back to Adam's state. He restored us to an even greater state than Adam's. Adam wasn't seated at the right hand of God, but the second Adam brought us into a position to sit at the right hand of God in Jesus Christ. Jesus brought us to share all the privileges and blessings of the second person of the Godhead, himself, Jesus the Christ. So there's a difference between the last Adam, Jesus, and the first Adam, uh, first Adam, Adam. <laughs> the last Adam became a life-giving spirit. <clears throat> the first one was only a living being. But the second had abundant life. A life that is godlike with the ability to create and to impart. Verses 46 through 47. But it is not the spiritual which is first, but the physical, and then the spiritual. The first man was from the earth, a man of dust. The second man is from heaven. Now notice this analogy here. Regarding the first Adam uh, is what we're going to look at, and then the last Adam. First man, second man. Why does he use these phrases? If we look at it in the natural, we could look at airplanes as our example, and we could say, well, the Wright Brothers plane is the first model of the airplane, right? Then we would say that the stealth plane is the last model of the airplane. That's the most, uh, I don't know any more than that, that, that are really super duper, you know, but anyway, and, and full of tricks and bells and whistles. So what am I saying? I'm saying that the, the stealth is the last of that type, airplane. Now, if I say Wright Brothers, plane, their airplane is the first of its kind, and the stealth is the second type of the plane, what does that imply? By using the word second, it implies that these two planes are totally different. Like the Boeing 737 is different from the Boeing 747. It's a different type of plane altogether, although they are developed from the early stages of the airplane in general. So in that same way, Jesus, the last Adam, he was the last Adam, 
and and that like, that's a kind of or a type of uh, that fallen man all right or the na nature that was there that um, Jesus became part of uh, am I making this clear let me say this again and maybe it'll, it'll help you so just like in the airplane first and second being a type of Jesus was the last Adam and and the last of that kind all right the last of that type of the fallen man or the nature that was there that Jesus became part of all right when he took he took upon himself the form of sinful flesh okay but Jesus is bringing forth a new kind of man in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 17 it says it's a new species the word new creation in 2 Corinthians 5 17 in the Greek is a new species it means a new type of man something more powerful than what Adam could have imagined so then it's the second type or kind of man 1 Corinthians 15 verse 48 as was the man of dust all right so also are those who are made of dust and as is the heavenly man so also are those who are heavenly okay now, doesn't that imply that some of the heavenly attributes of the body through the Lord Jesus Christ can be tasted, can be experienced on this earth? What a blessed promise. I mean, we're more than what Adam was. Verse 49, just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. This is a different type of body. It's a different type of physical body. So, some of the examples I gave you are Adam had a perfect, uh, a perfect physical body. If he had lived a thousand years, he would have looked the same as the day he was born. All right, he would have he wouldn't have aged. He wouldn't have grown old. And also the same with Eve. But that physical body of Adam can't go through walls. It was in a different dimension than the physical body that Jesus had when he was raised from the dead. Okay, there was a limitation to the physical body that Adam had. He had all the attributes of the eternal life, but he didn't have the attributes of the heavenly life. That was extra special. Now, when Jesus raised uh, was raised from the dead there was a new type of man or species that he came to bring forth Jesus's physical body was uh, flesh and bone like ours he told his disciples when he appeared to them in his resurrection I'm not just a spirit I'm also a physical body for a spirit doesn't have flesh and bones they touched that physical body of Jesus that was resurrected they had no trouble feeling it plus that glorified physical body could eat now we know that Jesus ate fish when the doors were all locked and, and, and uh, he was in that upper room with that <laughs> Jesus suddenly appeared and 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 with he was with that physical body he he appeared in a physical body and he said peace be to you then he said that, then he it said, goes on it tells us that he sat down and he ate with them a meal of fish and after that he went right through the wall now we <laughs> we actually can't understand how the physical body could go through a wall but we can visualize it because we could see him um, like kind of like a hologram but he ate fish a spirit ate physical fish so now we have a problem we understand his physical body going through the wall because it's a spirit sort of you know what I mean it's spirit so we can kind of get our head around that but we have a hard time imagining a fish going through the wall also that isn't glorified I mean he wasn't eating heavenly food was he he was eating physical food from the natural that has weight but and it's and has a solidness to it but when the physical food enters that special glorified body of his it took on the supernatural quality of being able to go through walls as well there's no record that Adam and Eve were able to do that or float around Adam and Eve walked on this earth but that body that we have from the Lord Jesus Christ when he comes again is a body that can float around in other words we can travel at the speed of thought the physical body that we will have in heaven won't need wings to fly we'll be able to think about going somewhere and find ourselves there supernaturally transported now I'm showing this to you so that you'll see that the second type of man and the second kind of body that God gives is a different one than the one we have now it's far superior to Adam's body it's a new species and we are that new species and able to partake of that that's what it talks about able to taste of the, that immortality so first let me say that every healing is a type of miraculous working on the physical body in heaven, uh, there the body there there's body parts waiting to be sent to this earth. Um, G. B. Paul was in the hospital for a heart condition. All right, and this is a documented event. His wife uh, uh, was coming in for prayer, 
and she took a handkerchief that had been prayed over and brought it to the hospital. That night, while G.B. was laying there in the hospital bed, an angel came and looked at his body, and his wife sat and saw this. This is what the wife said that she saw. The angel pulled the zipper on his body. Then the angel took out something and put, in the, put it in the trash bag. Then the angel took some body parts out of the, the bag he was carrying and put those body parts <laughs> into GB and then zipped him up again. Wow. Now, everybody would think she was a complete lunatic. I don't because I know what the Word of God says. You see, there are laws working that are beyond this natural world. And from time to time, God does allow our physical bodies to partake of immortality. If we are to walk closely with God, our whole body may be transformed, you know, and caught up with Him. I mean, it happens. Uh, you see, we taste of the powers of the age to come. Now, we know that Enoch walked with God and then he wasn't because God took him. That's what, it, what the Word says. All right. Enoch walked with God, and he was so close in his walk with God that he was transformed and walked right on into heaven. God says, well, why don't you just come on in? So he did. <laughs> you see, he tasted of the powers of the age to come, and then he liked them so much that he hung out in them. And you know what happened? God said, come on home, Enoch. Now, the following are three things I shared with you from people who have gone into that realm beyond the limitations of the physical body. This is from that other teaching, but I want to tell you about it, okay? First is the energy and the life force in the body. All right. When a baby is born, the energy in that baby's body physically is tremendous, my friends. The cells multiply rapidly. Think about how fast a baby grows, even a puppy or, or whatever, how fast those things, you know, their bodies grow. All right. But we're talking about a baby's body physically because that's a human body. All right. The cells multiply rapidly. Metabolism rates extremely high. In the natural realm, as a person grows, the metabolism rate decreases. See, there are recorded instances of little babies who have like lost a finger and grew a new finger. For adults, we know this is impossible, but it's not for babies. That energy force that's there can continue to be replenished from the spirit realm because in the heavenly realm, the energy force never decreases. All right. We have in Romans 4, verses 8 through 10, 18 through 20, Abraham, who contrary to hope, stood in faith. In hope he believed against hope that he should become the father of many nations, as he had been told. So shall your descendants be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead, because he was about a hundred years old, or when he considered the bareness of Sarah's womb. No distrust made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God. All right, that's the scripture. Now we know what happened to Abraham's body. Perhaps he received some of those new parts from heaven. <laughs> we know what happened to Sarah's body as well. Their youth was renewed like the eagles. Even though their bodies aged, they gained strength, so much so that Sarah once again looked beautiful. You see, the energy force of God came into her, and her physical body regained strength. The body parts were renewed. Just like the eating the fish in the glorified body, it now takes on that glorification. Okay? In the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 34, verse 7, it tells us this. Moses was 120 years old when he died. His eye was not dim. He had super eyes. He didn't need to wear glasses. The world is telling us that by the age of 40, the lubrication in our eyes starts drying up, and we need to add lubricant to them. We also find it a wee bit harder to see. Well, according to your faith, be it unto you, okay? You believe it, you accept it or receive it, and so it becomes uh, whatever it becomes. What comes from your mouth? You say, I am old. What do you do? You get old. Deuteronomy 34, 7 says, Nor his natural force abated. It says his eyes were not dim and his natural force did not abate. He was strong, folks. He was still climbing mountains when he was old, 100 years old, 120 years old. These are all foretastes of immortality. And if we begin to move further and further into that realm, the physical body can be so transformed that it may reach a point like Enoch's body reached where he completely stopped aging. What is that? It's time immortal. For those who walk in higher faith in God, there is a realm you begin to walk in where mortality is changed to immortality. It begins, folks, it begins in what you believe about healing. It begins about what you believe about God, what God's Word says about uh, your body. You, you know, as far as what it is. It's the temple of the Holy Spirit. 
it, he's in, when Christ enters into you, and at the time you're born again, you become a new creation, a new species, a new creature in Christ Jesus. You're in Christ. You'll never leave him. He's in you. You're in him. Everywhere you go, he goes. Everywhere he goes, you go. But he doesn't go out of you and go there and alongside of you. He is in you, and you are in him. You are completely ensconced and enrobed in him, completely covered in his body. He's the armor of God, and you're wearing him. All right? That when you get that into your head and your heart, when you begin to actually operate in that and you begin to call those things that be not as though they were, when you begin to stop saying you're sick, stop saying calling sickness and disease into your body and realizing that Jesus healed you at the cross so that you have no more sickness and disease, you will begin to walk in that divine health and wholeness. You'll, it, you'll begin to see that you don't get a cold anymore. You don't have any aches and pains. And sometimes you'll get one, but you know it's a symptom, so you thwart it off. You're, you speak to it and get rid of it. And you don't listen to your body. You don't let your body tell you how it feels. You tell your body how it feels. It feels marvelous and wonderful, and the symptoms vanish instantly. So you'll begin to, to taste of that immortality. Now, for those who desire God's presence and walk more deeply with God, that presence can and will transform your physical being into the fullness of what immortality is like. In Genesis, and we looked at Enoch's life, Genesis 5, verses 23 through 24, it says, Thus all the days of Enoch were 365 years. Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. Now, it didn't just say that God took him. God may have taken him in the way he took Elijah. But it says Enoch walked with God and was not, for God took him. The words was not implies a transition from mortality into immortality. As he walked with God, the body that was became was not. Get it? The body that was subjected to the laws of this natural realm was suddenly no longer subject to them. It was transformed, and people who walk closely with God seem to have a certain degree of that. They're preserved from the law of corruption and decay. And when Jesus Christ bore all the sickness and disease for us on the cross, it was in, an, in, in, a, it was in a legal form and not in the physical form. All sicknesses came because of a broken law. And Jesus took that legal implication in judgment for the broken law. Got it? Okay. The Bible tells us in the book of Acts, chapter 2, verse 27, For thou wilt not abandon my soul to Hades, nor let thy Holy One see corruption. The moment a physical body dies, that physical body begins to decay because there are germs and viruses that begin to attack that body. In fact, while we're alive, our body is being attacked all the time. However, because of that energy and that life force in our body, your body cells kill all the germs and viruses that constantly try to invade your body. The moment life goes out from your body, the body ceases to defend itself and it just decays, goes back to dust. Jesus Christ, his body, never decay, decayed. God did not allow his flesh to see corruption. For three days and three nights, that physical body that was kept in the tomb was preserved by a life force that still remains today, a resurrection life force on that physical body. Now then, did he take our sicknesses and our, our diseases? Absolutely. It was by legal transaction. When Adam fell into sin, all sickness and all disease then had a right to enter the human race. So when Jesus took death, he canceled that right. And anyone who believes in him, then that not right of sickness and disease to enter into your body is canceled. And based on that right, believers can be healed by his stripes. Now, we don't know what it was like with Moses' body. When he died, we're told in the book of Jude that Satan wanted that body and God wanted that body. So there was a war over a dead body. Moses' spirit and soul were already with God. In the book of Jude, verse 9, it says, But when the archangel Michael, contending with the devil, disputed about the body of Moses, he did not presume to pronounce a reviling judgment upon him, but said, The Lord rebuke you. All right, Satan and Michael, uh, the archangel, were wrestling over Moses' body. Why? Well, let me help you understand. Moses' physical body has seen the back part of God's glory, which no man has ever seen. Up to Moses' time, all mankind has only had glimpses of his glory. However, Moses had seen the back part, the hinder part of his glory. We know what happened to Moses on that day. The word tells us that every, the very skin cells of his face were so affected by it that they became luminous and shone brightly like a light bulb. What about the law of science? Well, God created all the laws of science, my friends. Science can't create new laws. They can only discover laws that have been pre-established by God, and God is above all natural laws. So something's happened to Moses' physical body, and the Bible specifically mentioned the skin of his face. 
Exodus 34 verse 29 tells us Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone. All right? Yet something happened to the skin. Something happened to the whole body as well. You remember in God, death does not exist, right? In God, only life exists and there is no death. And apart from that, mortality, immortality came on Moses' body. And what I'm saying is that part of that uh, life that exists came on, on uh, uh, Moses' body, his immortality. So we have a foretaste of immortality of the life of God that is possible. In heaven, every fruit tree is constantly producing fruit. Every flowering plant is, plant is always producing flowers. Why? Because of God's presence, that immortal life can flow into our physical body here, right now, on this earth. That's rule number one. Then immortality can come in your organs, so that no matter how old you grow, your physical heart will still be young. Your physical body can still be young. You can grow in age, but your body doesn't need to age. And your eyes don't need to grow dim. You don't need to lose any of your teeth. You can have perfection of body depending on how much you tap into number one, immortality of the body. <laughs> okay? We see only a glimpse, a taste of the power to come. The second point, when immortality under the power of God comes on this physical body, gravitational laws won't limit it. When Jesus walked on the water in Matthew 14, he was walking by a different law. The laws of gravity limit this physical body of ours to keep us here on this earth. Now, for a moment, under the power of God, Jesus' body was freed from the gravitational pull, and he walked on water in Matthew 14. Now, when we spend a great deal of time in God's presence, when God says, go, like Jesus, we won't hesitate. It's a tremendous power, and we have been given it. It's ours. People who walk with God seem to transcend that gravitational law. There are many recorded eyewitness accounts of people defying gravity, and I'm not talking about in an airplane or with the help of some natural thing. When this happens, they are, they are glimpses of the physical body taking on the power of the immortal body. In the New Testament, in Acts chapter 8, this happened to Philip, the evangelist. He had baptized the Ethiopian eunuch, and Philip was taken up. That's a foretaste of what the body can do. One of these days, as we get more deeply rooted in God's presence, we will just go to other places at the speed of thought. In an instant, it's possible for us to do it right now. You know, but we, and we have evidence of, as glimpses of it. If you walk deeply enough, it can be a permanent transformation, and then you go into glory. It's possible. As you live in God close, so closely that the presence of God will so fill you that you can go without food, walk on water, travel at the speed of thought, stop aging, and so much more, in heaven our, eternal, our internal organs are all different. There is food in heaven, but the food is not for survival. It's for pleasure and for impartation. You don't have to eat in heaven to live. You live by God's life. How lovely when a glimpse of that comes upon this earth. In the book of 1 Kings, chapter 18, verse 46, we're told of a time when Elijah ran before Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel. Then, in 1 Kings 19, verses 5 through 8, it says, And he lay down and slept under a broom tree, and behold, an angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was a, at his head a cake baked on, a hot stone, on hot stones and a jar of water. And he ate and drank and lay down again. And the angel of the Lord, excuse me, oh, the angel of the Lord came again a second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, else the journey will be too great for you. And he arose and ate and drank and went in the strength of that food for forty days and forty nights to Horeb, the Mount of God. His physical body took on immortality. It existed on heavenly life for forty days and forty nights, folks. Some people think fasting is difficult, yet it depends on the level of the presence of God. When you break into a deep realm of God's presence, it seems like your whole body goes into a state of suspended animation. The physical functions all cease and all the spiritual functions take over. When the divine life and immortality start coming to this physical body, something takes place beyond our natural, something we have difficulty comprehending. Jesus lived 40 days and 40 nights without food and water, and he was under that special anointing. Notice that only after that, he was hungry. Before that, he wasn't hungry because the physical body, for a moment of time, took on the immortality that I've been speaking of. Everything in the natural seems to have suspended state. We know that God's power surpasses our physical life. Our physical body can be immortal. Now, the key behind it all, in Hebrews 11:5, says, By faith, Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death, and he was not found because God had taken him. Now, before he was taken, he was attested as having pleased God. All right. Enoch was seeking the pleasure of God all the time. Uh, he, he was always in the realm of the presence of God. Hebrews 11.6 continues to say that without faith it was impossible to please God. And Romans 4, 
talks about Abraham and Sarah, and they tapped into that renewing power in the physical body through their faith. I was asked a question a while back, how we develop this great tenacity of faith. The answer is this. For me, either the Word of God works or I die. When you reach that kind of commitment level, either the Word is true and your whole life depends on the Word, or you die. Then you'd rather die if it's not true than live. When you begin to trust God with that kind of tenacity, that kind of trust, that kind of belief, and you say, God, if I die of starvation, it's because I died trusting you, and it's your duty to continue to supply. So if I die, I die. If I trust, I trust. When you begin to walk with God with that attitude, then your life revolves around either this word is true or I'm serving a dead religion. Either what we are talking about is reality or just some religious mumbo jumbo. And if it's reality, I would rather see the word working in my life and live. If this word doesn't work, I would rather not live because my life would have no purpose. Thank God the word is true for whosoever has an absolute trust in the word. Faith is the operative, all right? Romans 8, 2 says, For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set me free from the law of sin and death. Hallelujah. Sin and death are all those things that operate on the mortal body, and if the law of sin and death is broken, then your body is no longer subject to mortality. What makes something mortal is the law of sin and death, and if that same law is canceled, immortality comes. That comes by the law of the Spirit of life. That's the third key. The partition, the operation, I'm sorry, the operation is through prayer. It's the same law operating and working in God's presence. Verse 11, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from Christ Jesus from the dead will give you life, will give life to your mortal bodies also through his spirit who dwells in you. So turn over to Romans 6 verse 4. We were buried therefore with him by baptism into death, so that Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Number one, faith. Number two, the law of the spirit of life. Number three, the glory of the Father. Three different degrees. Jesus was full of grace and glory, which is why the glory of God's important. As you tap into that glory, immortality comes into your body. Moses had one glimpse and his body was transformed. The rod of Aaron was in the glory and it blossomed and bore fruit. The glory of God is what we seek. That glory will cause immortality to come on this physical body. Did you receive this today? I pray that you did. If you need further uh, assistance with understanding the message or would like more information, contact me. I want you to understand something. We're starting the, uh, this is the beginning and the advent of the uh, series on power. Immortality is powerful, my friends, and you contain inside your in, in, inward body, your spirit, in your inward man, you, you uh, retain that power. And I'm just telling you this is just a, a foretaste of what's to come about the power of God in your life. And um, so you don't want to miss any of these uh, Master's Word classes. Um, but I want to say that, um, well, I, I don't know what I want to say. I lost it. It went out. So I'll, I'll just go forward. I invite you to join us for the Master's Prayer Room broadcast on Tuesdays at 9.30 a.m. Pacific Time each week on Ustream.tv. We begin our program with the Word of God followed by your prayer requests, which may be submitted by email prior to the program. And then I pray over the request with you, and we're seeing marvelous results from these streaming live prayer programs. Tuesdays, 9.30 a.m. Pacific Time of each week on the Master's Prayer Room on Ustream.tv. Everyone is welcome to join us for live prayer. For a full programming schedule, go to our website, themasterstouch.org. That's www.themasterstouch.org. Email us at masterstouchhs at cox.net. That's masterstouchhs at cox.net or poet at cox.net, P-O-E-T at cox.net or MTHS prayer at cox.net. The MTH stands for Master's Touch Healing School. Then the word prayer. Do not spell out Master's Touch Healing School. It's MTHS prayer at cox.net. Remember this, wisdom is the principal thing, therefore get wisdom, and in all you're getting, get understanding. So be sure to keep Jesus Lord of your life. You know, the Master's Word is an extension of the Master's Touch Healing School of Ministry International. We're a 501c3 organization. My dear friends, 1 John chapter 4, verse 17 tells us that as Jesus is, so are we in this world. Let me ask you a question. Is Jesus immortal? Yes, so are you. How is Jesus? Perfect. So are we. Vibrant in the life, divine life and health. So are we. Operates in his supernatural abilities. Hey, so do we. Always successful in all of his works for God the Father. So are we. And so much, much more. So get a hold of this. Meditate on this scripture until you become it.
my friends, be blessed.